Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the York County History Center uh, and uh, the Historical Society Museum in our second Saturday lecture series. My apologies for our late start. We do have lots of announcements, but I'm going to say till the end so that I can turn the time over to Samantha Dorn. Sam was uh, born and raised in York, and the branch of the first family tree are entwined with the rich history of contributions from, from some of the most prominent Black families, including small Hawkins. And Samantha began volunteering at Lebanon Cemetery located in North York in May of 2019 after the death of two family members led her to spend more time at the location. And she's been eager to lend her skills as a professional grant writer to the community based project to get a little closer to home ever since. Um, she joined a Facebook group known as Graveyard Cleanup Volunteers, and from there things rapidly evolved. The group has uncovered nearly 400 grave markers, and that was just a 2019. Um, the work continues. Members with the passion for genealogy have traced their roots to individuals and families interred at Lebanon Cemetery and to friends of Lebanon Cemetery, an organization that works to preserve the history of the cemetery and the lives, families, and achievements of the individuals interred there. So today's uh, topic is Af African American suffragists in York. And so without further ado, <laughs> we'll turn the time over to Sam. Thank you. I'll make sure that all technology and everything is good to go so that we can uh, move forward with presentation this morning. So thank you for those that are here uh, with us physically, as well as those who are joining us uh, on Zoom today. Um, this will be out on Facebook Live, and then also it is being recorded uh, so that people will be able to go back at another time uh, to look at the information as we're moving along. There was the mention of Lebanon Cemetery. I am a volunteer uh, with Lebanon Cemetery, which is in North York. Uh, many of the stories that I'm going to be talking about today do appear on our Facebook page, uh, which is the Friends of Lebanon Cemetery. Uh, and you'll see the green logo uh, that we have here. So we're gonna go ahead and jump right in. Uh, know that I am looking at notes <laughs> today um, as I'm following along here. Uh, because I want to make sure that I'm able to do justice for these individuals uh, and the work that they have done for our community. I'm just see them right here. Yeah. I can just say next slide. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. We'll work with it again. And next slide. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, the women's suffrage movement was a decades long fight to win the right to vote for women in the United States. The 19th Amendment was certified as law on August 26, 1920. Technically granted women the right to vote. Technically. However, the 19th Amendment did not initially extend to women of African American, Asian American, Hispanic American, and Native American heritage because of widespread sexism, enduring inequality, and racism from within the ranks of the women's suffrage movement. White Southern support of women's suffrage only existed so long as racist and supremacist racial lines were upheld. Next slide. Black suffrage in the United States in the aftermath of the American Civil War explicitly referred to the voting rights of Black men only. Black women still had many hurdles to face before obtaining the basic human right to vote. Next slide. Frances Ellen Watkins Harper. Many of you may be familiar with that name. Certainly she's been celebrated all across, not just the United States, but throughout the world. She was an abolitionist, a suffragist. She was the first African-American woman to publish a short story. She was a co-founder of the National Association 
of colored women's clothes. But in 1852, or approximately 1852, Frances Ellen Watkins Harper was a teacher here in York, Pennsylvania. Shortly after coming to York, Maryland passed a law stating that free African Americans living in the North were no longer permitted to come into the state of Maryland. So this was shortly after the 1852 timeframe. And so Frances uh, Harper took on the role of, of anti-slavery and championing anti-slavery. By 1866, Harper spoke at the National Women's Rights Convention in New York, where she urged her fellow attendees to include African-American women in their fight for suffrage. So remember, initially, men only. Harper helped to form the American Woman Suffrage Association, advocating for the rights of all women. She was born in Baltimore, Maryland. Next slide. Fast forward to the 1900s, about 19, between 1913 and 1915, we start to see Alice Dunbar Nelson. Uh, Alice Dunbar was the wife of Paul Dunbar, and he was a poet. His name was very well known, and quite frankly, uh, she was able to get into a number of places based on her husband's name. And so, you know, as I'm looking through many of the articles and things you'll often see, of course, indicative of that time frame. Um, sometimes the women do not have their name uh, represented. It will be Mrs. and then the name of their husband. So Mrs. Paul Dunbar uh, was an English teacher. Uh, she taught in Wilmington, Delaware at Howard High School. Uh, she wrote a number of short stories. She was a poet. She was a political organizer, we mentioned here the NAACP, as well as a public speaker. So you're gonna to start to see some themes as we're working through this today. Again, highlighting short story writing, poet, the big one, educator. One of her quotes here, black women's votes would add to the strength of the black community. In 1915, she took some time off from teaching and she was traveling throughout Pennsylvania, advocating for the women's suffrage movement. There are a number of articles that you can find online. Uh, certainly, if you have a subscription to uh, newspapers.com, but come on down here to the History Center, to the library, if you don't, to be able to access that type of information. Uh, and you will find a number of uh, articles in which Ms. Dunbar is here in York, Pennsylvania, staying at the home of Etha Armstrong. I'm throwing a lot of names at you guys, hang on to that. Etha Armstrong, where Mrs. Dunbar stayed. Next slide, please. This here is from the University of Delaware. Um, they have several of her original documents and um, notes. I believe she had about eight books that are on file. Um, that you can search online. They've archived this information, so it is searchable. Uh, and I pulled this particular one. So the book that talks about her travels in Pennsylvania in 1915, there's probably at least four or five pages that are dedicated to York. And again, you can find these articles here um, because they did appear in our local newspapers. Uh, so that information is there. So this particular one was from November 2nd of 1915. Um, where she's asking for, quote, a square deal, giving women the right to vote. On the next slide, um, a little bit about York's suffrage movement, the, the women that were working here. Now, I'm using the terms that were utilized in that time. So you'll see and hear things such as Negro, you'll see and hear things such as color, because that is how it was represented. So the Negro Subcommittee of York County for the Women's Suffrage Movement. We have in the early years, Ms. Etha Cole Armstrong that is serving as that president of the club. And I have some of the names of a few of the other women uh, just to uh, help people to understand or, or even to know their family lineage um, and the role that they played. So Mrs. 
Georgina Paul Fulton, Mrs. Susan Foster, Mrs. John R. Reeves, Ms. Catherine Gibson, Mabel Brown, Clara Foles, sister of Ethel Foles Armstrong, and Julia Fred. Again, several articles where we talk about specifically the Negro subcommittee here in York, Pennsylvania for the women's suffrage movement. Next slide. A little bit about Ms. Etha. Etha Carol Holds Armstrong. In 1905, at the age of 20, she claimed the distinction of being the first and only colored girl in York that was employed in a factory as a skilled hand. She worked in a, in a shirt factory. But she also completed home nursing courses at Christmas Attic. Ms. Etha, as I mentioned, served as that original president. She was the chair for York's Women's Negro Subcommittee. She was also the adopted daughter of Reverend Jesse Sumner Cole. Reverend Cole also interred at Lebanon Cemetery, had escaped from slavery from a plantation in Virginia, and he fought in the Civil War. In 1895, he brought his family here, which included two young girls that he and his wife had adopted. In 1895, they come to York. He passed away in 1897. His wife passed the year before in 1896. And those two young girls went to live with the family of John Reeves. Also, a name you may know, Helen Reeves Baxter. That is where they went to school. We'll talk a little bit about that as we move through. Um, I, not to embarrass her, but uh, feeling like I'm in the midst of royalty, Miss mm -hmm. Ethel's granddaughter is here with us today. Thank you, Mary. Next slide, please. See, you're going to make me emotional. It's been a wonderful journey meeting people throughout this process. Uh, we have here at the sister was Clara Carol Cole. I put the Carol here because that was their name um, before they were adopted uh, and, and wanted to um, give the, the family its full view and credit here. So Miss Clara, um, of course, Negro Subcommittee, um, throughout the years, you know, she and, and Etha were uh, pretty static for over, say, a, a 30 to almost 40 year time frame of working on women's rights. Um, so, you know, at any given time, no different than what happens with a lot of nonprofits today. We all like fill those different roles. You know, this year you might be president, and five years from now you're going to need to be the treasurer. <laughs> so, so you'll see these names kind of moving around. Um, so, just keep in, in mind that it's not all at the same time, but know that these are the roles that they play. Um, but here we start to talk a little bit about York's Phyllis Wheatley Club uh, is referenced. Now, in the picture, the larger picture that I put up here, we have a woman closest to me um, by the name of Virginia Carr. We're going to talk about Miss Virginia in a moment. I believe uh, uh, your brother always says, Aunt Virgie. <laughs> and, and if I get the folks wrong, please point them out because I'm going by the newspaper, but you'll know the faces. Uh, standing then, we have, uh, that I believe is Etha Cold Armstrong standing, uh, Miss Clara is sitting, and then we also have a Clara Young. But on the side closest to me, kind of cut off, uh, is a gentleman by the name of, I hope I have this right, Floydell Anderson. And he was a graduate of Tuskegee, came here to York to be one of the directors of Christmas Attic. So I'm going to throw that back at you. Tuskegee, hang on to that. Tuskegee, get another link. Next slide, please. A little bit about the Phyllis Wheatley Club. The Phyllis Wheatley Club, um, there are women's clubs that were created by African Americans starting in the late 1800s. The first club was founded in Nashville, Tennessee in 1895. And there are still some clubs that are active. Uh, I don't believe we have any active in Pennsylvania. Uh, if we do, that's wonderful, but uh, you can go online and you can see some of these clubs are still active. The purpose of the Phyllis Wheatley Clubs did vary from area to area, although most 
were involved in community and personal improvement. Some of the clubs helped in desegregation and the voting rights efforts, which we saw here in York, Pennsylvania. The clubs were named after the poet, Phyllis Wheatley. Phyllis Wheatley was the first African-American woman to publish a book of poetry. Phyllis Wheatley was emancipated or set free by the Wheatleys shortly after the publication of her book. She died in 1784. 1784, and then we kind of jumped a little bit to Francis Harper in the mid 1800s. And then I made the move to Mrs. Dunlop. But I wanted to go back and show that historical timeline and what these ladies were involved in. Here, again, we have a poet. We have a published poet in the 1700s. Next slide, please. Miss Virginia Har, member of the Phyllis Wheatley Club. I have at the top here one of the newspaper headlines where it says that at that particular time, the Phyllis Wheatley Club was meeting at the home of Miss Virginia Har, pretty much directly behind where we are today. So the base of the uh, Negro Subcommittee for the Women's Suffrage Movement was primarily in the 200 block of East King Street. So several homes and some ladies lived in five, I believe about five different addresses where they would alternate um, having their meetings. Uh, some of the pictures that we see, it looks like they're having a tea party. It's very dainty, it's very pretty, and I'm thinking very strategizing <laughs> what was taking place in those homes. So a little bit about Virginia Carr. She was an artist. Uh, there are a number of her works that are listed uh, over a 50 year time frame. And that includes after her death, not just here in North Pennsylvania, but also throughout, I believe, this Northeastern region, um, but certainly all across Pennsylvania, you could find uh, Miss Virginia Hart uh, works. Uh, there was a newspaper article that was published about maybe two years ago uh, with Jim McCore, where we are still looking to track down some of the paintings because some of the families here in New York may not have any idea that they have her works of art um, in their homes. On the next slide, please. Virginia Har's paintings were displayed for the 50th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation in 1913 in Philadelphia. But in 1920, Virginia Har and Mrs. Julia Craig from York, Pennsylvania, made their way to Tuskegee, Alabama to attend the National Negro Women's Association Convention that was held in July of 1920. There were approximately 1,700 delegates there, too, from York, Pennsylvania. In regards to Tuskegee, I mentioned a little bit about Mr. Odell Anderson. 1920, Julia Craig, Virginia Har at Tuskegee. By 1938, a young woman by the name of Fanny Pittman marries a man from York, Pennsylvania and moves here. She was the granddaughter of Booker T. Washington, founder of Tuskegee Institute. His granddaughter moved to York went to Zion AME Church where she played the piano. She was an accomplished musician. And who are her church members? Oh, those names like, let's see here, Virginia Har, Julia Craig, Clara Cold, Ethel Cold Armstrong, Ellen Reeves Baxter. Ladies, all together in church. So again, we have this connection to Tuskegee. Next slide, please. Lindell Mold Muldrow, niece of Virginia Har. She was a school teacher 
She also served as an organist and a musical director at Zion AME Church for 48 years. She was a member of the Phyllis Wheatley Club and a director of the Teen Town D Club at Christmas Addicts. Anybody recognize that name, Walter? Son, a police officer, grandson, I believe now the current police commissioner in New York, Pennsylvania. She was the niece of Virginia Hart. We have a moment to go to the next slide as we're moving through. Take your time because we want to make sure everyone's hearing okay. Thank you very much. Ms. Leah D. Hopewell, graduate of Wilkes Force University and Western Maryland College, also a York City school teacher, a theme of education. She worked for the USDA as a home demonstration agent. And in 1953, she received the Freedoms Foundation Award, which she accepted in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The paper that she wrote that was submitted was selected as she was a student for York Collegiate Institute, now York College. Also the theme of their commitment to church. For 50 years of service, she was honored as well as uh, a number of times when they had uh, presentations in honor of Ms. Leah Hopewell. Next slide. I'm moving through these a little bit fast as we uh, go through, and then I kept some material just in case on the back side if you guys uh, didn't have a lot of questions. I'm going to put this one up and then we'll pause for just a moment. In that, this says 1922 is a newspaper article. I do have the link to the newspaper article, and for those that are at home, uh, one of our other volunteers, Ms. Tina Charles, is adding some of the links to the site as we're doing this. And then also we'll make sure that the presentation is available, that you'll be able to go and see the full um, articles that are, are referenced here. This is just the clipping. But in 1922, there was a story um, in regards to the oldest woman that had been uh, able to vote or uh, registered to vote. And the folks here in New York said, wait a minute, that's not true. We can claim that distinction. At 106, once a slave, Carolyn Craig. Now, I don't know much about this. You know, there's always an exception to the rule for things that happen. But this is printed in the New York Dispatch in 1922. Next slide. And then, as I said, that's what we'll call it. Now, I don't know much about Ms. Carol, but I do know a little bit about one of her family members. Remember this name? In 1920, Virginia Har and Julia Craig at Tuskegee. Ms. Caroline was her mother in law. So, this is two years, uh, the article on Ms. Caroline was two years after Julia was uh, down in Tuskegee. Julia Craig served as the president of York's Phyllis Wheatley Club. I talked about rotating those roles um, through the years, but she importantly was the organizer for the entire Commonwealth of Pennsylvania for the Pennsylvania State Federation of Women's Negro Clubs. She lived here in York. Numerous articles referencing her role and what she did in regards to women's suffrage. So I'm going to stop there for just a moment and see, are there any questions uh, as we're moving along for those that are here? Yes. Uh, that is an excellent idea. I have not looked through that, but that would be a great follow-up we will be able to work with that and, and happy to send that information over. You know, one of the things that we're trying to do is make sure that as we are doing research and as well as others in the area that we are getting this information on file here with the industry center um, to make it accessible for others to be able to pull that information. So as I said, um, these copies will be here. And as far as myself and, and others that work with us, you know, we've been very fortunate 
that so many others have been able to share information with us. Um, as Becky and June, certainly I, I thank you. Um, without you, you know, kind of leading the charge for us and pointing us in the right direction, we would not be here as far as being able to compile that information. So that would be an excellent idea for that. Mm -hmm. On the next side, well, actually for a whole break here. So I have an article here, and this is from 1936. Mm -hmm. And it had to do with the mm -hmm. Phyllis Wheatley Club. They're giving a uh, program that they're doing. Um, and, you know, oftentimes, of course, with songs and things on that line. But it's references that at the very last paragraph. And there, it is a longer article. This is just a clipping. Miss Lois Lambert, a student at West Virginia State College, talked of ideas and gave uh, a detailed account of her first year at college. Now she graduated from York High in 1935 and Felicia had about five other classmates, African-American classmates. And these ladies with the Phyllis Wheatley Club made sure that those young people were taken care of before they went off to college. Okay, so we do have um, all of their information. The uh, interesting thing about Ms. Lois is that when we pulled up the names of those graduates in 1935, you know, kind of the light bulb goes off of, huh, I wonder what they did with their life. Not prepared for the answer. As a teenager, she participated in York's Phyllis Wheatley Club. Next slide, please. Class of 1935. She was a member of the Phyllis Wheatley Club, as I said, as a teenager. So I graduated from York High in 1935, and then she went off to college. She came back to York, uh, which is on our next slide, but you can just hold here for just a moment. Um, she came back to York to be able to you know, apply her skills and to help work with the young people coming after her. Here, themes, poets. Her poetry was published uh, in the yearbook for her graduating year, uh, as well as in the newspaper um, that you're able to find some of her full work um, for what she was able to do as a teenager. Next slide. So here we find that when she graduates from college, she comes back to York to work at Christmas Addicts. And she's working under uh, Ms. Helen Reed Baxton. She works there at Christmas Addicts for a while, uh, and then she leaves to take a job, I believe, in um, yes, Newark, New Jersey. So she takes a job in Newark. She's working there. She gets married to a young man, the last name of Reeves, cousin of Helen. Again, it's a York connection. And then, uh, and he's a rapper. So they move, you know, as he following his career path, she continues her education has several degrees, including a master's in social work. Next slide. What's the year? 1961. <coughs> Remember, graduate of York High, William Penn, 1935, had been a member of the Phyllis Wheatley Club as a teenager. In 1936, she's here talking about her first year of college. And then when she graduates from college, she comes back to York. She works at Christmas Attic. She goes off to work uh, in, in Newark, gets married, ends up in Tuskegee, Alabama, as a director of the YWCA. And in 1961, Lois Lambert Reeves is a witness in a court case for the federal government. Here, I believe we probably all know of this case, but never knew that it had direct ties to York, Pennsylvania. When she got married, of course, now she's going by Reeves. And we're thinking Lois Lambert, York, Pennsylvania graduate, the part of this federal case down in Alabama. And so on the slide here, on the little clipping, it talks about her having that master's in social work. Um, part of the argument was that the Negroes were not educated enough to know how to vote. She certainly, which is why they chose her as a witness, 
uh, had plenty of education, uh, but I believe this was on her third try in 1960. Um, the first two, she was unsuccessful with even getting into the building. The third try, uh, which didn't happen, she got in, I believe it's at about four o'clock in the afternoon, and they told her that she had to copy that parts of the constitution and clear that she didn't have enough time to be able to do all of that. Um, so she's a witness in a court case in 1961, but she had that foundation working with the women in York, Pennsylvania, who were fighting for the right to vote. This is 1961. Women's suffrage, we just celebrated the 100 year anniversary of women's suffrage last year, 1920. Why? Remember, originally the women's suffrage movement, the amendment was approved in 1920, but Black women were not included in that. 1961, we're still fighting. Next slide, please. So as we were reading a little bit, learning about Ms. Lois Lambert Reeves, and I highly recommend that you read about her. You can Google her name now that we know who she is. Um, there are a number of books that have been written by civil rights leaders over the years, um, including Mr. John Lewis talks about his time with Lois Lambert Reeves of York, Pennsylvania. Uh, so back during Black History Month, we uh, put together a little video clip that uh, Tina Charles was able to put together. And from that, her daughter who was out in California reached out to us and she was telling these stories. And she said, Ms. Storm, she said, I stepped on all of those men as a child. They all stayed at their home. They stepped on the floor. So when you talk about you know, the, the, the marches that took place down in Alabama, when you talk about Selma, North Pennsylvania, so um, Ms. Lois did come back to work for a period of time and there are a number of articles where she's working um, and doing some programs on the Ellen Saxton playground, Ellen Lee Saxton. Uh, but she was the person that was pioneering what is now our neighborhood programs or our neighborhood associations in the city of New York. That all came from Ms. Lois. On the next slide, this was published in 1934. Remember I was saying that you can see a number of her works that are out there. And just looking at the first two lines and the last two lines. Rise up and take your place in life before it is too late. Rise up and take your place in life and do not hesitate. Next slide, please. August 6th, 1965, Black women were officially allowed to exercise their right to vote. The women that we talked about here today are just a sampling of those who worked here in North Pennsylvania, but worked to make sure that women throughout the country, Black women, had the right to vote. We can go to the next slide, which is just here. I have some of the contact information. However, I wasn't sure how we would do on time. So I do have a few more people um, that we can go over, but I wanted to take a moment to open up for any questions and if there were any questions that came through online. Mm -hmm. So Ms. Hannah has been keeping us very, we've got all of it, we are ready. Yes, we have, uh, I, I made sure that Tina had the links to articles, she pulled some things, I pulled some things, so all of those are there so that you'll have those original source documents. Yes, and then if you can speak up for us, please. Um, you didn't mention this, I just noticed in the slides that people are talking about. Yes. Are there people that you have that have been located? I'm so glad that you said that. There was a rhyme and reason for why the logo appeared. So anywhere that you would see um, a logo such as that of Lindell Gold, Maldro, those individuals are all interred at Lebanon Cemetery in North York. Um, what we've done is uh, with our group, 
we've made that information available free of charge. As I said, certainly the stories are on our Facebook page, um, but also utilizing uh, billiongrades.com. So it's billiongrades, all one word, dot com. If you search uh, while you're at Lebanon Cemetery, it will walk you directly to their final resting place that you would be able to do kind of a self-guided walking tour um, for these ladies. Any other questions? Okay, we'll go past this slide and we're gonna come back a little bit because we talked about that knee, Reeves. So Helen Reeves Saxon, you'll remember at the, and Clara, when uh, Reverend Coles and his wife passed away, they became, um, well, John Reeves, uh, which was Helen's father, became their guardian. They went to live with the Reeves family in the 500 block of Cleveland Avenue. So Helen Reeves Saxton, uh, director of Christmas Addicts Preschool, she also served on the board of directors. You will see her at many of the uh, Phyllis Weedy Club meetings. Um, I did not see where she was serving on any of the um, executive committee, but she was often at the meeting. The meeting. What I'm thinking is self-preservation. She had enough sense to know that she might be overextended and she took on a leadership role when she was already doing so much at Christmas Addicts. Um, so that's kind of a message to all of us. Like sometimes it is okay to just say no <laughs> and still be there to support. Um, so she was, was often there. Uh, with um, Ms. Saxton and her family, you know, one of the things that we found as we're doing this research is that many of our prominent Black families, um, their homes and their businesses today in 2021 are vacant parking lots or grassy parking lots. Not just one or two, but several. For the families that uh, were involved with the Underground Railroad in the 100 block of North Duke Street, now a parking lot. The uh, families of uh, the area that is often known as Black Wall Street, the 100 block of West Princess Street, York High parking lot, Moravian Playground, previously Moravian Cemetery, Moravian Playground, on a corner of what is now Pershing Avenue and West Princess. Pershing back then was known as Water Street. York High parking lot and also used for the Agricultural and Industrial Museum parking lot. That Moravian playground was the only playground for colored children in York. It started around 1919. And the list goes on. Yes, ma'am. Have a sense of when period of time that this started happening, or did it seem to happen over a long period of time? Um, it seems to uh, be happening over a long period of time. It fits different uh, time frames, but you know we're looking at and tracking those things. I'm I'm a math science person. I generally don't remember names, but I remember locations. And as I started seeing names, you know, or excuse me, addresses that were repeating. Uh, we started laying those out into a database. Um, so the interesting thing here with the Reeves family, with Mr. John Reeves, one thing that he did for all of his children, as they married, he made sure they all had a home. He bought each one of his children a home. They were all together. Ooh, that would kill me. Um, <laughs> imagine living next door to all of your siblings. Um, I'm teasing, I love my family. Uh, but with that, but he made sure all of his children had a home. So that was the 500 block of Cleveland Avenue. And I believe some of the homes were also on boundary just around the corner um, and they're no longer there as well. So that is something that we're looking at. So when, when, when you're ready to do the walking tour of vacant lots in York, um, we can have that discussion on what happened uh, and, and how, you know, in many ways our black history was literally erased um, as far as the structures are no longer there. The next slide, please. Anyone know Ms. Ella Robinson? I see the CB2 head shape. Ella Robinson, daughter of William and Eliza Robinson, was the first African American to graduate from William Penn or York High. She was the first. That was in 1868. 1868. She went on to teach at the Smallwood School 
Um, and then at some point, she was also principal for the Smallwood School. Uh, when the school was built, she was a teacher until she retired. But as I said, she served many years as a, princ as a principal there. She also was a member of that Zion Amy Church, um, as well as, um, you know, in many of those uh, Phyllis Wheaton Club meetings, you will find Ms. Ella J. Robinson. So with that, I'll go ahead and just be able to wind down. I do also have Helen. Helen is her sister. Uh, Helen died at a very young age, uh, but she, education, we talked about. She also graduated from York High, uh, William Penn in 1911 and went on to study at Howard University. This is what our women here in York, Pennsylvania were able to achieve. Through some of the worst times, they were there leading the charge. And we thank them today for bringing us this opportunity. And we wanna make sure that we can continue to honor their memory and their work. I really want to get into the home. Uh, Miss Etha's family still owns the home here on King Street. And now that I know all of this, I'm thinking there might be some like hidden compartments in the walls or something. So just know that I want to go on a scavenger hunt. If anybody wants to join me, <laughs> we'll do that. So, so thank you uh, for this today. I do ask that you stick around. We have a few announcements in regards to Second Saturday. And I do want to thank the folks here at the History Center. Uh, for inviting me and allowing me to present this information to all of you today. But also, I'm sorry, you've been in the librarian for years. I just really, really appreciate you sharing that information. Someone teacher for Thank you. And, and let me just say, I, I mentioned June and I, I mentioned this Becky, and certainly Anne. Uh, there are so many times, like right now, when I get ready to start research or if I'm looking for information, I look for their names first because they probably already covered it, which is beautiful and wanting to expand that information out. For me, and I say this all the time, knowledge is nothing if it's not shared. Having this information, doing this research, and just putting it on file. So everything that we've done, as I said, we're, we're putting them in format so that they are um, searchable, that they can be viewed online. We encourage everyone, certainly to utilize the resources here uh, with the History Center, researching your own family. And, and, you know, this is one thing that for me, um, there was so much, you know, you know about your aunts and uncles, you know about your parents, but do you know what they achieved? Because I will tell you, um, in speaking to the Armstrong family, uh, many of the times they will say to me, I had no idea. Because that's not what we talk about around the dinner table. And we have so much to be thankful for. So I appreciate it. And, and ladies, thank you.